All right, guys, we are live. Thank you very much for joining me on another Sessions with Sham episode. I am very, very happy today uh, to welcome to the show Yogi Baba Prem. Yogi Baba Prem is a yogacharya and author on yoga, Ayurveda, and Vedic astrology. He also operates Universal Yoga, which offers a traditional path that is focused on the empowerment and transformation of the individual through spiritual study and meditation. So we're going to have a great conversation today. So first and foremost, uh, welcome to the show, Babaji. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to start off uh, by sort of asking you, because Hindus don't tend to be a very aggressively proselytizing people. So what initially drew you to adopt a more Hindu philosophy? Well, you know, it's interesting as a child, I knew that I was looking for something spiritually. I'm in the US and I grew up in uh, the country and I couldn't really connect or find what it was I was looking for. It's not like today on the internet, you can right. type a couple of things and you can find anything. Um, so I really struggled for a long time to find something. And I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I used to drive past a place called the United Yoga Institute. Wow. And I'd keep looking at their awning every time I would drive by. And I went in and they had a philosophy home study course. That oh, wow. Due to the teachings of Vivekananda. Right. And uh, I began with that and it was like coming home. It was everything that I'd been looking for, but I didn't have the nomenclature. I didn't know the jargon. And uh, it, it really transformed my life. Um, and uh, from there, I started moving into the study of yoga. And after about a year of study, I think I got uh, a certificate from them. And I remember standing there looking at my certificate going, okay, I've invested a year in this, and I'm now ready to start serious study. So the certificate really, for me, only marked a beginning rather than a conclusion, as it often does for people uh, in the West. And I just kept going further and further and further. And uh, it popped up in my mind the Vedas was really important. And this would have been in the 80s. And right. nobody in the U.S. in the 80s was talking about the Vedas. Right. And I'd go to different teachers and bring up the Vedas, and they'd just largely laugh at me. Like, nobody studies the Vedas. Why are you wasting your time with this? And I was about to give up, and I came to uh, David Frawley. Hmm. Deva, yes. And talked with him. And uh, he was so wonderful. He really helped me to put pieces together with the Vedas and provided a lot of important instruction and guidance in my study. And uh, everything's just kind of continued um, from there. So do, do you feel like since you started your journey and to this point, there has been any sort of shift in... because let me ask you about America because that's what you're familiar with. So in America, have you seen any, any more of a shift between people's understanding of Hindus and what the Vedas are or were in the 80s and to 2018? Do you see any movement or any difference? Well, the, I think back in the 80s, I really longed for the 80s again because <laughs> the students that were coming to yoga... Um, they had a different mentality. And I remember teaching once and a lady came up to me and she said, I'm doing yoga because Madonna's doing yoga. <laughs> and that's not an indictment toward Madonna or sure. the lady, but I realized at that moment that everything was going to change. And the students started to change. What the students were looking for started to change back in the eighties. And, uh, we were more looking for spirituality. We were looking to connect with something deeper. And once we kind of hit this point, this mark where everybody's mentality started to change, it became much more physical. And it became more about the physical self and almost a type of body worship, so right. to speak. 
Now, what's interesting is nobody in the 80s was talking about the Vedas. Nowadays, everybody's talking about the Vedas, but I'm not convinced that everybody has a lot of study in the Vedas. Um, you know, the Vedas is a very technical text. It uses archaic Sanskrit, and it really requires a huge investment of time to unlock the secrets. Um, it requires good meditative ability, and there's a technical aspect with chanting as well that most people don't take the time to learn. Aside from learning basic Sanskrit, you've got to understand at least the swatas. And um, I think when we chant from the Vedas, it's important to honor the Rishi uh, in addition to the Devata and even the Gayatri, or not the Gayatri, the meter or Chanda um, has a, uh, an important aspect within yes. the mantra that needs to be honored. And I don't see a lot of that within people. So physically with yoga, we moved more physical. With the Vedas, we use the word Vedic a lot, but right. uh, it seems anything falls under Vedic in the West. Right, that's true. And f so how do you, do you know a little bit about how yoga first came to the West? Because I feel like when yoga came to the West, it only came in the form of just the asanas. It came in the form of, okay, this is certain poses. You do the downward dog, you do the upward, whatever. And that is what got almost codified in America. And in I think in the broader West as well as yoga. Do you, do you think people, the general population or anybody in fact knows that there is more to yoga than just, you know, doing the asanas and wearing the yoga pants? I think there's groups of people, uh, small groups all over the country that recognize there's this deep, rich essence, the Dharma uh, of yoga that uh, exists. And I do believe there's people that explore that. I think they're in the minority, um, but there are people that explore that. I think one of the problems that we ran into is back in the 80s, there was an into the 90s and into about 2000 or so, there was a lot of movements to try and license yoga teachers. Yep. And um, this was very concerning. The last thing you want, in my opinion, is a government agency overseeing the licenses of Dharma, spirituality, things of that nature. So there were several groups that came up to counter this and I think uh, Yoga Alliance was trying to counter this movement, and I don't speak for them, but uh, this is from my memory back then. Right. Was trying to counter this push toward licensing. So I think that their motivations were good initially. They were trying to head off something at the past, so to speak, and stop it before it manifested, but. Um, the problem was that the criteria for teaching students, in my opinion, was somewhat, um, uh, we didn't really ask much of students. Right. I guess that's the way to put it. And I think we were too quick to give certification. And that led to this nurturing of this body consciousness and this overemphasis of asana. Plus, back uh, for a while until the advent of the Internet, it was very difficult to get books from India. Hmm. Difficult to know what books to get from India. And um, it really required more of aspiring teachers than a lot of people were um, wanting to give at that particular time. But I think that the overemphasis on asana can be a little bit unbalancing. And I no doubt there's health benefits that come from it, but I don't know that it's always moving us toward the actual goal of yoga, which would be samadhi, if you're coming at it from uh, Patanjali's standpoint, or super consciousness, or self-realization, or moksha. Um, I don't think that yoga has a lot of emphasis, emphasis on those qualities anymore, in the West anyway. 
I do see that because I, I remember uh, the gym that I go to, they have this class, which is called extreme yoga, which apparently is it, they play like super heavy, like dance music. And then you do yoga poses. And I feel like if you are looking, if you are a yogi practitioner, that is such a strange atmosphere to be in because you're doing yoga to still your mind, to still your body, to still your mind. But at the same time, you have this loud music playing that just completely takes you out of the experience. And uh, that's that's sort of what I tend to see more when I look at uh, yoga in the West and how uh, sort of the West understands yoga as well. So I think you definitely do have a point there. And one of the things that I've all often felt, you know, about Hinduism and people's understanding of sort of Hindu philosophy and uh, a Hindu mindset is that when you're trying to understand, let's say, Christianity, when you're trying to understand, let's say, Islam, then you essentially, you go to one book, you read that book, and you have everything that you need to know about that philosophy from that one book. Hinduism is very different in the sense that there is, isn't is one book that people tell you, hey, go read that, that'll be everything you need to know, which is one of the great things about Hinduism. But at the same time, when you're when you're a novice that knows nothing about Hinduism, for example, and is trying to learn something about it, that can trip you up a little bit about, okay, where do I start? And what's the end point? And I know there's no end point essentially, but if you were to suggest somebody who's watching right now, who wants to learn a bit more about the philosophy of Hinduism, what's a good point to start? Well, you know, I think probably for a lot of people, most people read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Right. The problem is, is most people don't realize there's basyas on these uh, um, a variety of texts. And these are wonderful, wonderful commentaries filled with insight and depth. So uh, most people gloss over the Yoga Sutras and keep it rather superficial. Um, I think the Bhagavad Gita is an important place for people to start um, from the standpoint that it is a yoga shastra and it introduces concepts such as the gunas and other important concepts to teachers and practitioners i think it helps to lay an important foundation for uh, students and for teachers alike but i think it's really important for teachers to be wide read or well read I think it's important to have experience with the Puranas. Um, there's a variety of other yoga texts uh, that exist. Uh, another big one is the Hatha Pradipika. That's a, a good one for people to uh, explore with yoga, but there's no shortage of text in India. Oh, for sure. And uh, I think teachers should try and expose themselves to as many texts as possible to see the different views, the different understanding, the different approaches toward the same goal. And all too often, that's not what occurs. We kind of just leave it with uh, the Yoga Sutras and we never go beyond that, not to be demeaning toward the Yoga Sutras. Right. It's a wonderful text. But the key with the Yoga Sutras, of course, is the commentary. And the key with many of these texts are commentaries. And that takes us into a dangerous area as well, uh, especially when we look at words such as moksha and papa. Um, those words cause me uh, some distress because right. papa seems to always get translated as either sin or evil. Yes. And the problem with the West, with the West Christian samskaras, even though most people that came to yoga were in rebellion against Christianity, and they were trying to step away from it and its dogma, the samskaras are still there. So when they encounter a word such as evil or sin, it's very easy for the mind to color that in with a Christian narrative. And you even see that, and this goes back to the 1800s when they were translating some of these texts. And you even see that in modern day writings, you'll see moksha as salvation. Right. 
And there's no salvation in Hinduism. That's right. not a Hindu concept. And uh, I think that misleads students, misleads teachers, and there should be a duty on the part of the translator to put a good footnote that really explains moksha and papa and what it really means within Hinduism. We have a few terms that don't translate well into English. Dharma is a very difficult word to translate. Ritam is easier to translate. It's just universal laws than yes. Dharma. And I think Westerners also struggle or don't recognize that terms sometimes have slightly different meanings at different times um, in different texts. And uh, so they need to be exposed to this and have an opportunity to see the bigger picture of these terms. Uh, I think in the West, we tend to lean more literal because we were conditioned with one book, one way of looking at it, yep. and that's it. And the beauty of Hinduism is many ways. I always like to equate it to a beautiful gem. There's many facets on the same gem, and all the facets are beautiful that comprise that gem. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, when people say, you know, often you'd hear when people talk about Hinduism is they would say that Hinduism has 330 million gods and goddesses. And th that's correct, but that's a way of just saying that there's many ways that Hinduism allows or, or encourages people to ex explore their own journey to find themselves their own way. The three three thirty million gods and goddesses are just different people's ways of discovering their true nature. Yeah. That's that's what that really is. And one of the things that I've seen, uh, and you, I don't know if you've noticed. And of course, I don't want to go too political, but I'm just talking about in ideological terms right now. But one of the things that I've seen is over the past few years, since you know, since I've been in the U.S., I've noticed a sort of revivalism in uh, a more strict form of Christianity, at least over the past few years in certain areas. I can't say if that's necessarily the case with some place like Chicago, but in sort of central rural areas, I've, so you've certainly seen that. And we always see that sort of clash where Christianity just can't seem to get along with you know, sort of other systems of thought and other uh, systems of beliefs. And the same problem we're having uh, with Islam in Asia and the Middle East right now. And I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I want either, that everybody convert to Hinduism. But what I'm saying is, how do you think we can address this situation of this clash with with sort of an open-ended, open-minded uh, Hindu philosophy without necessarily making the Christians feel like it's being forced upon them? Oh, that, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> I, I know. That's why I asked it and you answer it. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the big challenges, and I don't really know how we're going to overcome this, is the theology of Christianity that there is only one way and that there is only one savior. And this, um, this comes at a big price. And uh, I agree, there is a resurgence of conservative Christian ideologies and uh, fundamentalism that is occurring in parts of the United States. And um, I encounter it all the time, and it's kind of getting uglier and uglier. Really? Uh, I've had people, I mean, I go to a funeral, and people find out what I do and what I'm teaching, and literally will not talk to me. Wow, really? Uh, yeah, they, they won't interact with me. and I mean, as soon as they hear what I do, they literally will turn and just walk away and uh, leave me standing there. It's um, incredible. It, it, it is. And uh, I even ran into this in my own family. My own mother told me I was not welcome in her home as long as I did yoga. Oh, my goodness. And uh, so there's a, uh, I guess there's for some Western Hindus, myself being one, 
they face a lot of challenges uh, from the Christian community um, at times. I think the movement is toward interfaith dialogue. And I think interfaith dialogue is a good idea. I like it on paper, but I think it really is only going to make a difference when you have the big organizations step in, like the Southern Baptist Assembly, the Catholic Church. And when we move past this word tolerance, I yes. don't like the word tolerance. Um, I prefer mutual respect. So I think that we need to move in a direction of mutual respect between religions and Dharma. And, um, but it's got to be a reciprocative uh, relationship, um, not just Hindus being respectful, but they need to receive respect for their particular views, their particular beliefs. And I think that's going to take a long time. I think so too. And I think you really hit the nail on the head with the tolerance and uh, mutual respect concept because that's the first concept that needs to manifest itself in society. And it's going to lead, it's going to, lead to some really good things because that's such a core concept. Because when you're talking about, you know, you're at a funeral and somebody just finds out what you're doing and turns away and walks away. That's, that's them just tolerating you, you know? Yeah. They, the fact that they didn't deck you and just walked away, that's tolerance, but they still in their heart of hearts believe that you're pr probably going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, there's, there's no way to save you unless you come back to the fold. And so that's, them tolerating you but again you're right that's not a complete concept that is not a that is not something you just don't feel good when you think that there's somebody out there that thinks that way about you but however when somebody you were talking to that same person and they were like you know what i don't necessarily agree with what you're saying but i but i accept you for who you are and i accept you for what you believe and that kind of acceptance yeah once you get to that it's a small step but it's still a very big step ideologically. Yes. Once you get to that step, that way, then you can really sort of, you know, start to start to move ahead, I guess, with the conversation. And that's when that interfaith dialogue, that's when that dialogue can really make a change when that first step is taken. So I think you definitely hit the nail on the head with that one. And I kind of wanted to talk about one of the things that you spoke about in a recent video that you put on YouTube as well, and I watched it through your Twitter profile, and it was about the, and we've sort of touched upon it a little bit, but it was again about the attempt uh, in certain circles. This is, And this is again, people say, I've, I've heard some people from India say that, oh, this is the West's fault, but I don't think we can pin this completely and solely on the West. And what I'm talking about is uh, the attempt to distance yoga from its Hindu roots. And that yoga is very deeply Hindu. Uh, that attempt is what I'm talking about. I mean, the Indian government has been putting out messages where they're saying if there's, it, yoga has nothing to do with Hinduism. It's just for physical fitness. And, you know, that that's just a lie, unfortunately. That's just a straight up lie. And, you know, you look at the concept of the, the different kinds of yoga. You look at Raj Yoga, Karma Yoga, uh, Gyan Yoga, and all, all the others. You look at... Uh, and Raj Yoga is such an integral concept for Hindus to attain moksha that we call the, the attaining oneness with the ultimate consciousness. It is such an integral concept for Hindus. And that Raj Yoga is yoga. So to say that the one of the most integral concepts to Hinduism is not a Hindu concept is such a silly thing to say, but that doesn't stop people from saying it. And I, my, it's a two-parter of a question. Number one, why do you think this happens from India as well? Like it's a strange one. And number two, how is it possible to sort of create a narrative to again rejoin yoga to create that sandhi again? Well, you know, I uh, I think the problem we have in the West is that, and and this is historically, if we go back to when the Mughals. Uh, were in India, for example, when they encountered the Bhagavad Gita, 
the Bhagavad Gita was a very profound text to them. And it was so profound that they put forth the idea that this must have come from Islam. This uh -huh. couldn't have come from India. This had to come from Islam and suggested that somehow India appropriated this from Islam. There were attempts to rewrite the Gita as more of an Islamic type text. Um, so what we see historically is powerful desires of people to own this knowledge and to kind of claim it as their own. I don't think in the West that your average yoga teacher is thinking that consciously, but we see a lot of efforts to own the knowledge of India. One of the big things that occurred was the attempt to own patents to Ayurvedic formulas. Right. The West was very oriented toward that. I think that there's attempts to kind of westernize text we see in India, I just saw something recently, I think on Twitter or Facebook, um, they were chanting the Gita, but they were inserting the name of Jesus in certain places. Right. Oh. Um, so I think one of the things we have to recognize is that the teachings of Dharma and India, Bharata, Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma are profound. And they answer a lot of questions questions that people have that other religions have not adequately addressed sometimes. And people want to own that. They want to bring it in and say, this is ours. This is our whole thing. And it's nobody else's. And that's very dangerous because when we do that, we tend to water it down. We tend to make it so much less than it is. And that was my video. We were talking about the modern claim that yoga was created in the 60s, which is just absurd. <laughs> and it's so easy to just dismiss it as absurd until you realize yoga teachers are being taught this, which means they're going to teach their students this, which means down the road, everybody in the West is going to, not everybody, but a large number of people are going to believe this. So um, I think we have first the problem of ownership. And we see academics pushing back hard about Hinduism's claim of this being part of Hinduism, because they don't want this dynamic of ownership uh, to be under the banner of Hinduism. But I think we have to acknowledge that this information came through realized rishis and gurus. They were the ones that brought it into the physical world. It already existed in the ethers, but they brought it into the physical manifestation. Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma has been the caretaker for untold millennia of this information and knowledge. And the reality is in any other tradition, we would be expected to acknowledge the source that it came from. Right. You know, if someone back in the 80s when the new age was really flourishing, people might say, well, this is a technique that comes to us from Native Americans, or this is something I learned from uh, a Buddhist retreat I went to. Right. <laughs> but it always surprised me how Hinduism was missing and how it was never acknowledged, despite the fact that most of the New Age concepts came from Hinduism. Right. You know, the bulk of the New Age philosophy is kind of piecemealed Hindu philosophy stuck together um, for people. So I think that um, we need to educate people that it's from Hinduism. It is a Shad Darshana. And that that's okay. You know, you can still do it. And it's not going to, nothing bad is going to happen. Right. Thing yoga and the fact that yoga is a part of Hinduism. Um, I think we need to educate the Westerners. My greater concern is India is importing Western yoga. Yes. And um, I see that having 
long-term consequences as well. And um, that, does, uh, that does worry me. But I think that uh, part of this problem is we as Hindus have created part of this problem by not educating people correctly in the beginning. Yes. And by not standing up for this concept um, for the past 70 years or so. I was at Swami Dayananda's um, quite a few years ago before he passed away, and there was a meeting of people to talk about Hinduism. And one of the things I brought up was you need to reclaim yoga. And um, what I was told was let them have yoga. So really? I was shocked that Hindus would say that because... With Westerners, once we give a piece to Westerners, they want to take all the pieces as their yeah. own. And um, uh, they appropriate all of this, and then it gets re-imported back into India and really causes uh, a lot of discord in India. So in India, my take is we're starting to see the same thing occur. Yoga is starting to become very asana-based, it's becoming more about physicality. I'm starting to see the selfies appear <laughs> on social media and things of that nature. So what's disturbing about this is that India is giving up something beautiful, rich, and wonderful for something that's so much less and somewhat incomplete. You know, if we look at the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, I think he only mentions asana twice, something yeah. like that. He, he doesn't really put a heavy emphasis, yeah. though it's a limb. There's not a heavy emphasis on it, but yet we're very obsessed with uh, this. So my worry is long term, this could have some, some profound effects for India. And I think that it's really the duty of swamis and gurus and rishis and teachers in India to put forward another message and to install um, a sense of pride, if you will, into the greatness of the teachings. Because India is kind of abandoning elements of this for a Western model, and the West is running toward this because... Uh, other forms of spirituality and religion haven't been fulfilling and people are looking to fill this void inside and yoga and actually Hinduism is doing that for them. So um, maybe somewhere down the road, India will re-import that as well, but no doubt it will be changed. Oh, for sure. To some degree. I think so too. And you make a good point, but I also see now slowly, you see people like Baba Ramdev, I don't know if you're aware of him in India, and uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, who runs the Art of Living Foundation. They, th those two in particular uh, that I can kind of name off the top of my head, that have been doing some really good work in promoting yoga along with the spiritual qualities of yoga, along with the, the entire rounded concept of yoga is what they're teaching. And I know a couple of people who went to a yoga class at their gym, and then they went to a yoga session uh, with Art of Living Foundation, and they said it was just being on a different planet. It was just an exercise from a different planet altogether, because the Art of Living course is just so much more well-rounded, and you come, that's what they said, that they come out of there feeling complete, just feeling better, not just healthier, but they just feel better when they come out of that. And that is such an important thing that you don't get these days. You know, you in Chicago, every now and then, you know, somebody like BuzzFeed or Huffington Post releases an article about how people in Chicago in these big cities are, uh, so many of them are depressed and all they're doing to cure their depression is popping pills and it's leading to this insane opioid epidemic. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, yoga will cure everything, but what I'm saying is, when there are such incredibly tangible results to be found from practicing yoga, and you, when I say yoga, I mean the, the entire practice of yoga, from practicing that, there are so, so such strong, tangible cons uh, 
results to be had. And that's what I feel like people should be focusing on. I think the initial focus should be on that, is that let us help you first and foremost get out of this cycle of depression and pills and depression and pills because the pill isn't really helping it. What the pill does is essentially it alleviate, alleviates it for a while and then you go down harder. So then you need the pills even more. And so that's what it's doing. So I feel like that's a good way to sort of approach uh, or, or market, so to say, yoga in the West is for Indians, it's, they should view it if not just as, you know, to not abandon yoga and to not abandon the spiritual aspects of it, they should at least initially look at it as an economic opportunity, you know, just simply look at it first and foremost as an economic opportunity. If that helps you not strip yoga from its spiritual aspect, look at it that way. And then approaching the West, look at it in the sense of, or market it in the sense of, you know, let us help you at least try it out and see if it helps you with this cycle of just, pills and depression and pills and depression. And I don't know what you necessarily think about that approach. Well, I, I, you know, I'm all for things that can help people with their health and peace within their heart and calmness. Um, I think there's other layers that can be added in there over oh, for sure. people. Uh, I'm very Deva oriented. And uh, uh, I think the Devas add a very rich component to understanding ourselves to our journey, you know, if we can connect and realize our oneness with the devas, we can then realize our oneness with Brahman, and um, those can have wonderful uplifting effects within a, a person's life. But the ironic thing about spirituality in the West is people are longing for spirituality while at the same time rejecting elements of divinity. Uh, people have a real problem with God, um, and they create proto-images of what God should be and how this should respond. And um, I think that that's unbalancing. I know it's comforting at a certain point, but I think it's unbalancing because the images that we create are influenced by our own karmas and samskaras, you know? Yes. So if I go to the text and I understand Agni and I look at a ghee lamp and I can see that as an expression of Agni, and if I can see Agni in my digestive tract as Jathar Agni, and I can see Agni in my mind as Mano Agni, um, I have a much more real relationship with Agni that I can build on and I can use that fire and that light to transform um, my being and move from this more limited consciousness to a more expansive consciousness and a more expansive understanding. And I think that's what all of the ancient teachings we're really trying to get at, if we look at them, the devas are sewn into the fabric of everything within yoga. Yes. So people try and argue this with me, but as an example, many of uh, the yoga texts were recorded in Sanskrit. Well, with each of those Sanskrit le letters, you have a deva. And in some cases, you have many devas associated right. with them. So just looking at the Sanskrit, there's a Devic energy there. Reading the Sanskrit, there's a Devic energy. And there's a Devic energy that comes with the application of that sutra or that particular teaching. So while there's a lot of pushback against the Devas, I think we're kind of cutting our nose off to spite our face, so to right. speak. Because... Uh, we're distancing ourselves from one of the rich, beautiful parts of yoga. And when we're doing these asanas, as an example, the devas are present within the asanas. And when we're doing the pranayam, the devas are present within the pranayam. Right. When we're learning to meditate, we're often experiencing the battle between the asuras and the devas that the Vedas spoke of. So 
I take it the exact opposite approach, which is I recognize that people are uncomfortable with this concept, but I try and let them know it's going to be okay. Let's <laughs> just go and explore this a little bit. And let's put this in terms that are relatable. Uh, one of the big devas that I'm very into, and I seem to be one of the few on the planet, is Usha oh. uh, from the Vedas. And uh, I have a tremendous love for Usha or Ushas, if you prefer. And uh, I try and introduce students to Ushas because the dawn uh, is very important. We all experience the dawn physically every morning. Yes. And every time we awaken to knowledge, Usha is present, and we are awakening to that knowledge through that Deva's assistance and through our karmas and through transformation of the gunas and things of that nature. So um, I lean a little bit more in that direction. I try and also introduce our students to Devas and um, talk to them about Devas and uh, get them to understand that there's different devas for different gunas that help transform that guna and elevate consciousness, and then try to inspire them to study the texts that are associated with that deva. Uh, if, they, if they resonate with one and they want that to be their ishta devata, um, and to build that connection. It's about, to me, it's about relationships relationships with the students, relationships with the devas, even though the relationship's always there as dharma, we can cultivate it and uh, build a deeper relationship to transform uh, our karmas and uh, move in uh, realization. So um, I agree with what you're saying, and I understand that, but I think the devas also have a role uh, an important role in this uh, process. And I do believe that Westerners are looking for that. The problem is, is there's some skatas. They, they have this, most of them have a Christian uh, conditioning. So they kind of cling to Jesus. Right. They don't like the church Jesus. Right. So they create a proto image of Jesus. Of how Which is Jesus. like an Ishta Devata, right? Then they, they it, create Jesus like an Ishta Devata. It is, but they they just create the qualities that they would like instead of a rounded, right. full understanding, you know? Because we have, uh, you know, if you look at Shiva, you have very peaceful forms of Shiva. You have Rudra that can be very, very intense and very peaceful at the same time, the energy. Um, so with Hinduism, we get this more rounded approach and this multifaceted approach that, uh, in my opinion, is more comprehensive than the proto-image that we create. And the problem with the proto-image is it pulls us often back into limitation. I often tell people, one of the things we have to acknowledge is when we're talking about enlightenment, nobody has produced more enlightened beings than India. There's just no discussion about that. You have a, a documented history of thousands and thousands of years of, uh, of enlightened sages incarnating within India, people achieving enlightenment, that's not to say enlightened people haven't incarnated in other cultures, but without doubt, India has a, a tremendous system for working people in a measured way uh, toward moksha. And uh, my philosophy, if it's not broke, don't fix it, because, <laughs> you know, the system is kind of proven itself so people used to ask me why do you want why do you chant from the vedas and i said because it's easier than writing the vedas right you know it takes so much more to try and pull through all those mantras that's asking a lot of a person uh, but i can get the benefit from these mantras from my yajna from my havan or homa uh, that's left for me so it makes it much easier in my opinion for me to uh 
use the information that was there instead of rewrite the book. Does that make sense? Oh, definitely. And you you mentioned something about you know Ishta Devata and gods that I that I find very interesting because when you one of the things that you were talking about is a well-rounded image or or a well-rounded understanding of the gods to use the western term and so one of the things that i see that when you look at somebody like ram you when you look at somebody like krishna they they they're supposed to be you know ram is supposed to be maryada purushottam you know, uh, and things like that but even those people have some minor you know human like qualities you know that that make them sort of human and i feel like that is almost to show people that gods are people and vice versa so to say and we have that same spark of divinity that people might call it do, do you think that's a good way of looking at it or do you think i'm understanding it wrong because i'm completely open to understanding it wrong well you know i th- i think that one of the things that hit me when i first started meeting some gurus and and elevated spiritual people from india was how real they are right. i was really taken back by that because as a westerner at that time i had an image in my mind of what these people should look like how these people should act and it was shocking when they didn't fit in the box that i wanted them to fit in but at the same time it was really beautiful because it did exactly what you said it had this human element that was there there was an honesty that was present and i really grew to appreciate that honesty versus the image that i wanted in the box you know right. oh absolutely so eventually i threw the box out and said this box is worthless this is horrible <laughs> and i started to embrace that image uh that would be uh presented to me and that honesty that would be presented to me and i really found that i loved that quality um of hinduism it's very honest it's very sincere and i think it's important when we look back that we see even the rishis struggled with some things for instance vishvamitra struggled with his desires to be a certain type of rishi you know what i'm saying right and overcame this through his sadhana and achieved victory and left some important mantras for humanity such as the gayatri uh, mantra from 36210 of the rigveda um to me that's inspiring to me it it brings in that human element and i think it has a lot to offer so i think that you're on the right track in my opinion that it's okay for these people to have been humans right you know at night when i walk our puppy and i see the big dipper up in the sky i think of the sapta rishis i'm not looking for them to be human right the big dipper you know we're right. talking about a different vibration in a different state but when they were incarnated here i don't have a problem with these human moments that might occur within uh life to me it uh to me it gives hope right absolutely absolutely i i see that as well and I, that that's how i tend to look at it as well and i wanted to take a few few questions that people have sent in for uh for us one of the questions was very interesting so i want to put it up first and this is something that i am fairly ignorant of as well so i want this is something that i could do with learning too and you write about uh, ayurveda and if you were to explain to a novice for example me about what ayurveda is because ayurveda has a very strange understanding even in india and overseas you know people think uh, people tend to often classify as that you know eastern mumbo jumbo medicine and healing touch and all of that stuff but if you were to explain somebody simply what ayurveda is how would you do it well you you know i i have a great love for ayurveda right um you know first i think it's important that we recognize ayurveda is not mumbo jumbo right and i think it's important that we recognize ayurveda had surgery and 
one of the things that interests interests me is scholars try and argue with me. Um, modern plastic surgery is based on Ayurveda, right? And the father of plastic surgery acknowledges that he went to India to study these techniques and procedures Wow! Uh, to create what would be the first plastic surgery in the West, which was rhinoplasty. And he modeled the tools after the tools that were there. So wow. we really can't say that um, Ayurveda is mumbo jumbo. It had surgery, the surgery worked. Um, uh, we had uh, herbs. Well, what are modern uh, drugs except synthesized chemicals right. from plants often? You know? Yep. It's just a chemical isolate, and uh, that's the only difference is that there's a higher concentration of this isolate. So I think we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that Western medicine is embracing um, uh, some Ayurvedic herbs such as turmeric and it's acknowledged for its cancer fighting properties. So the first thing I think we have to realize is we have to take this mumbo jumbo thing and just push it to the side. Yep. Um, Ayurveda, if you look at texts like the Charaka Samhita, uh, it's most impressive their discussion on mental illness. Wow. And it's, it is shocking what a wonderful grasp they had on mental illness and approaches to mental illness. And because when we think about ancient peoples, we always think they all thought everything was possession. Right. And while the Chiraka Samhita will say there could be instances of this, it really focuses on uh, imbalances and their relationship with mental illness and mental suffering and depression and things of that nature. It's so sophisticated. It, it's amazing. What we've done in the modern era is we've developed tremendous technology. And we produce tremendous amounts of written papers. But uh, when we look back to ancient India and the Vedas and the Vedic teachings, it's, it's astounding what was recorded. And I always wonder what has been lost, you know, as we've lost so many texts to time. So when I talk about Ayurveda with people, I tell them it's a science of life. It is a system for maintaining balance within our body and mind. And it is the health aspect of yoga. People want to set yoga to this side and they want to set Ayurveda over here but they actually are very complementary. You need to apply certain yogic uh, or certain Ayurvedic approaches to one's yoga. And uh, it's to enhance, enhance your health. If you're not healthy, it's hard to meditate. Yep. You know, if you're in pain, it's hard to meditate. It can be done, but it's more difficult for people. So the ancients recognized we need to take care of our health. We need to maintain health. And uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful approach. And Ayurveda still can uh, treat serious diseases. And people go, well, you know, it doesn't always work on everything. And that's true. But neither does allopathic medicine. Right. You know, the, the, in the United States, I think it's either the second or third leading cause of death is actual medical treatment <laughs> in the U.S. So I think we hold Ayurveda up to an unfair standard that we don't hold allopathic medicine up to. There can be a lot of complex issues that are involved in healing. I also see, you know, you can see now scientists and medical practitioners and the medical kind of industry and field in general are starting to accept Ayurvedic principles. Like there are things within your body that you can use to heal the body. Uh, there was, I remember there was a very famous book called Freakonomics and Freakonomics had a case where there was a gentleman in Australia, a medical practitioner in Australia, 
that solved the stomach ulcer, that cured a stomach ulcer, which used to be a big problem a few decades ago. And he solved it by using some bacteria that was present inside the stomach. And so that is essentially a large part of what the Ayurveda talks about is healing yourself using things that you already have. And now I was just reading, there was this, uh, there, there was this doctor that published an article and it was about eating according to your blood type or some, I think it was something related to that. And that concept is so similar to eating related to your vata, pitta and your kapha. It is such a similar concept to that. And now it's gaining popularity. You see that in all the fitness blogs, you see it in all the wellness blogs, wellness, as they say out there. And you see that, okay, eat this kind of food if you're this blood type, eat this kind of food if uh, this is your bone structure and so on and so forth. And this is what you should avoid if these are the problems that you have. And so these are all concepts that are found prominently in Ayurveda. And then people take them from Ayurveda, but they are loath to say that we got them from Ayurveda or credit it to Ayurveda. Do you see that happening as well? Oh, yes. Yes. That's a, that's a, that's a big problem. Um, and uh, I don't see that problem going away uh, anytime soon. There's uh, Everybody's in, into branding. Yep. It's all about branding. They want to create their own brand. So they take all of this knowledge and information and they want to make their own brand and uh, they want to forget about where it came from and everyone to think that they came up with it. That's, uh, um, that's a real problem in the West and it's probably going to grow. Uh, I think so too, because, and I think this is where, if, if the Indian government needs to step in, this is where they need to step in. And when I say step in, I say, don't like put a patent on it, but I say they need to take ownership of the brand. They need to, so I always give the example of New Zealand. So in New Zealand, you will see, I was in New Zealand for a couple of years. And in New Zealand, you'll see you have uh, the milk and the meat and the wool that comes out of New Zealand is always considered to be the best quality in the world. And New Zealand markets it as such. It says 100% pure New Zealand. And then you pay a premium price for it. And if you want to get the best quality milk, meat and wool, you get it from New Zealand. That's that's established now. And that's what I think India needs to do. They need to establish themselves as the apex or the best source for yoga, for meditation and things like that. I think that's where India can really use or create, I think, branding as well. Okay, one of the other questions that, uh, that we got as well is, uh, have you ever visited India? And if not, what is the place that you'd like to visit most? I have visited India. Okay. My place in India is Jageshwar. Oh, where's that? That is in northern India. It's a little ways off from the, the tip of Nepal. Okay. And uh, um, Jageshwar has what some say is a Shiva Lingam, uh, a Jyotir Shiva Lingam. Right. And uh, that particular place was very, very, um, very profound for me. Very, very powerful. Um, uh, I absolutely adore Jagashwar. It's beautiful. Most people want to go to um, Rishikesh. Right, right. Um, I don't find myself drawn there. It's much more commercial for me. Yes. I liked being in Jagashwar in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's really my, my favorite places, uh, in India is these temples that are kind of off the beaten path and, uh, but have been maintained for a long period of time. I really, really enjoy, um, uh, places such as that. Same. I think I'd, I'm inclined to agree with you there as well. There's, I'm from a state called Bihar, which is in Eastern India. Uh, and so if in, so I live in the city, the capital Patna, that's why my parents live now. And so if you drive about 60, 70 kilometers away from Patna, that's where my ancestral village is. And so there in the village, just, just on the outskirts of this village is this little small temple, uh, that, uh, me and my dad, we used to go sit and meditate in. And those are something that I an experience like that and a temple like that is something that I much prefer 
rather than going to one of the busiest temples in Patna because it's the most famous temple. I much rather prefer that experience. I understand the, you know, the value or, or the attractiveness of going to those big temples, but I, I definitely much rather prefer going to a smaller one where I can, you know, I can be at peace and I feel like I can connect mentally. You know, there's outside of Rainikant, there's a little temple. I think it's Kalika. Okay. Outside of Rainikant. And uh, there's a much larger Durga temple there, but there's a little tiny Kali. You have to kind of squat down to get in and it's <laughs> really cramped inside. Oh my goodness. That was so intense. I mean, I can see Kali's eyes still. Uh, from the darshan of that, uh, um, it was very, very powerful. I love those little places. They're just, they're very, very special to me in my heart. Right, right. I completely agree. And Azad Hind is asking here in the top chat, and I have a similar question here from Gautam from Facebook as well, which says, uh, Hinduism allows independent philosophies, but do you think Hindus tend to be a little too agreeable? Do you think they tend to be a, a, a little too timid, let's say, when either talking about their philosophy or defending their philosophy in the public sphere? I think 25 years ago, I think that definitely was the case. I think something wonderful has happened within Hinduism, and this would be social media. Right. And I don't say that about social I media. I could not agree more. Yeah. I think that kindred spirits have found one another through social media. And I think that this has fostered a growing confidence among Hindus to feel good about Hinduism and to speak up about Hinduism and to uh, address falsities about Hinduism. And I see that growing and growing and growing. And it's wonderful to see. The thing that still concerns me is Hindus like to debate Hindus, <laughs> but they're still shy with antagonists. And while I realize debate is a great part of the tradition and is kind of sewn into the fabric of the tradition, I think we need to debate one another less and turn our attention to antagonists toward Hinduism false constructs and false narratives about Hinduism, like the Aryan invasion, the Aryan migration, and other things that are used to try and break Hinduism down. And it's very important for us to defend the Vedas. Missionaries in the 1800s wrote that the Vedas is what is standing between them and conversion. Yep. And you see them probe and try different approaches with the Vedas to take it down, to take Brahmins down. It's important for us to keep the Vedas very relevant. Um, many Hindus argue with me and say, Dharma's existed all of this time. And that's true, but it's a very different time and if we want examples of how Dharma needs support and help, we can look at Nagaland. Nagaland's probably the first Southern Baptist state in the yep. world. It's almost 100% uh, Southern Baptist. And we need to realize that conversion forces are patient. They're not looking to do this this year. They're not looking to do it in the next 10 years. They're content with 100, 150 years, 200 years. Right. So it's important that people are able to um, counter these false narratives about Hinduism and present compelling arguments um, against them, in my opinion. 100%. And I, I completely agree with you about the Vedas because I don't know if you're aware of Wendy Doniger, but Wendy Doniger yeah. in her books... She also makes that create, tries to create that distinction between Vedas and the literature that came after the Vedas. She says that, oh, Vedas were these were these books written by these bloodthirsty savages that came from Central Asia, and so their savagery is reflected in these books. And all the Vedas talk about is animal sacrifice and human sacrifice, and it's a 
violent texts. And then came the then came Buddha, and then Buddha came around and then civilized the entire Hindu society overnight for some reason. And then the Upanishads came along, and then you see the Upanishads that are just that are what truly Hindu philosophy is. But if you actually look at the chronology of the Vedas and the Upanishad, they flow very nicely together. It, it's a stream rather than you have a block, which is the Ved, and then you have another, another block, which is the Upanishads. Yeah. And it is clear for people to see that flow between the Vedas and the Upanishads. But for some reason, they just don't make that argument very forcefully. They just, you know, they, they, for a long time, they've been just sitting back and taking their arguments against the Vedas. And again, I completely agree that social media has been such a big boon that people, like-minded people, have been able to find each other. And then they've been able to try and work uh, to countering people like Sheldon Pollock, people like Wendy Doniger, and uh, there's, there's, there's an N number of these people out there. And one of the one question that is very pertinent, I think, to people in India and people overseas as well, I think it's coming from uh, Ritvik, Shrikantham. Ritrik Shrikantham asks, uh, what, what is a good way? Uh, sorry, this is Samanwe Samantha. Sorry, my, my bad. I'll ask you a question too, Ritrik. This is Samanwe Samantha who asks, what is a good way for somebody to get into meditation? What's an easy way? Because a lot of people who try meditation initially obviously find it very difficult. You know, um... I think in order to approach meditation, we have to address the second sutra of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. In the West, that has caused so many problems. And um, I think the problem is this word Narodaha. The, the common translation of Narodaha is absence, right. the thought. Um, and that's what most people set as their goal. That's just, it's not going to happen for most beginners. You, you might be that person that's just a <laughs> second away from enlightenment and you sit down and it happens. But for most people, it's not going to happen. Right. So I examined the word Narodaha and it comes from two words, near and rude. And um, what that refers to is without lower. So one of the things we want to do with meditation is we want to recognize that we want to remove lower thoughts. So a way to start with this is by um, just closing our eyes, breathing deep or doing a few alternative nostril breathing uh, breaths and just work to be an observer for a little while. You don't have to be great at it, you're not probably going to be great at it. Right. Okay. Um, but over time, you will be. I think the easiest approach for most people is mantra. Just chant the mantra and focus on the mantra and let the mantra do its work. And a wonderful mantra to start with is the Gayatri mantra. Uh, the Vyatritis, the, the Bur Bhuvasvaha, there's so much written about them. There's so much that they're connected to. They're very important mantras and they will have an effect on a person's psyche over time. And they will transform the mind over time. And more importantly, they will work on those lower thoughts to get those kind of out of the way. And, uh, they, it can be a very, very powerful tool. Yoga or meditation doesn't have to be the struggle people make it out to be. Right. But we have to surrender. And we have to give up our expectations and our attachments to what we think meditation should look like. And let it be organic and let it grow and let it nurture and feed us. And let our sadhana with it nurture and feed it as well. And that's the key is sadhana, daily practice. Doing something poorly for 15, 20 minutes a day is better than doing something once a month or, uh, you know,
you know, every couple of months or once a week, because you'll start to build up a Shakti with that. And in building up that Shakti, that Shakti starts to move you through some of these obstacles. So mantra is an easy place to start with. Uh, observation is uh, an easy place to start with, but wherever you start, it's important to be gentle and nurturing with yourself and to release these preconceived notions of what it should look like. Absolutely. And I, I would agree with that as well, because I've been, you know, I've been meditating for a couple of months and I'm still not good at it. So it, the, the important thing here is, is dedication. And the important thing here is discipline. And that, that is such an important thing to inculcate, no matter what culture you belong to, that dedication and discipline. So I think even for that, the practice of meditation and the practice of yoga is just makes it completely worth it just for developing those two qualities as well. All right, I'll take a final question from Ritwik. And Ritwik says, um, what, what, are the, what are the best uh, source books that you would say if somebody wanted to learn more about yoga and meditation? Um, well, you know, uh, there is a, um, you know, the, there's several Upanishads. There's wonderful Upanishads that are yoga Upanishads that a person can read. There's also the Hatha Pradipika that a person can read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, but I think probably the most popular in India would probably be the Bhagavad Gita, which is a wonderful, wonderful Yoga Shastra uh, as well. Uh, those are wonderful books to start with, but we need to also be mindful that not everything is recorded in a book. And it's really important to find a teacher Someone you can just talk with, someone right. you can ask questions of, someone you can get clarity on if you're having a particular experience or if you're not practicing something properly, they can make adjustments to what you're doing. So it's good to read all of these books. It's good to study all of these books, but it's very important, in my opinion, to have a teacher, someone you can talk with um, or a guru uh, not everybody has a guru, but they can have a teacher that's well along the path that can offer some guidance or insight um, from time to time as well. And that those are, those are really important uh, things to uh, incorporate within your life. It's great to know your Ayurvedic constitution yes. and foods that are uh, balancing to one's constitution. Uh, that can be a big plus. And those are things you can learn basically online. You can go take a questionnaire and have a basic idea of your constitution. It's not right. going to be as the pulse, <laughs> but you'll, you'll have a, a basic starting point. There's a lot of Ayurvedic practitioners in India that people can visit with. Um, those are important ancillary qualities to uh, a person's practice, in my opinion. Um, but uh, always remember, not everything's in a book. Yep. You, you know, a text, even though it's large, the Mahabharata has a lot of yoga in it and a lot of yoga teachings. And you kind of have to drill down to put it in a modern framework because there's layers of knowledge that are there. So chanting just from the Mahabharata can open up realization and understanding about particular passages. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can approach this. I think there's another Gita called the Anu Gita. And actually my favorite Gita is the Uddhava Gita. That was Krishna's final teachings uh, oh. to Uddhava. And I just love the Uddhava uh, Gita. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful Gita. And it doesn't get the press or the attention that the Bhagavad Gita gets. Right. Oh, excuse me. But it's a wonderful, wonderful text. And it expands on some things and clarifies some things. For instance, Krishna, I think, says to Uddhava that he accepts worship through Vedic or Tantric means. And I think that's very important because uh, 
sometimes you see Vedic and Tantric like right. this with people. Um, and he settles that debate in one simple line. So it, it has a, a richness to it that uh, um, is just absolutely fabulous. So I don't know if it's considered an actual Yoga Shastra, but it would be a wonderful book to read on to deepen one's understanding of the Bhagavad Gita and to expand uh, on it. And it's become more available than it was 20 years ago or so. If someone only speaks English, there's an English version of it oh, wow. that's uh, available now. Um, so uh, that's a great text to read. Fantastic. I think uh, I think you've given me especially, and I think all of us here watching as well, a pretty a uh, pretty good reading list for the next couple of months. So we should we should definitely get cracking on that. And again, I, I Babaji, I want to thank you for for coming on the show. Uh, I I was hoping to take a few more questions from the from the top chat here, from the live chat here, but unfortunately I don't think a lot of them a lot of them came through. Okay, there's one that I should take from the live chat because they've been they've been asking. So let me take let me take one from Puna Mabiji, which says uh, which of the most reliable translation of Uddhav Gita in Hindi and English, according to you? Uh, in English, of the Uddhava Gita? Um, well, there's only one. Okay. Of, um, and I forget Swami, Swami, um, I can't remember, but if you go to Amazon, I okay. think there's one that is there, so... I'm only aware of one English translation. Okay, okay, perfect. So, uh, Punamji, try try Amazon. Go up to Amazon and give it a shot over there. I'm sorry I wasn't able to take too many questions from the top top chat. Not a lot came through actually this time around, but we did get a ton of questions from Facebook. So I was, I hope I was able to take a few from there. Again, I want to thank you, Babaji, for coming on the show. I, I really do again appreciate your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to uh, to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you. No, absolutely, it is. It is absolutely an honor for me as well. And you know, again, this is this is one of the boons of social media that people like you and I can find each other and have these meaningful conversations yes. uh, and create a bit of knowledge around. Uh, you know, knowledge especially for me because I, I've learned a lot through this conversation as well. So <laughs> I again want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to thank the people here for watching live. I also, if you guys would like to check out uh, Babaji on Twitter and his uh, website, it's provided in the description down below. You can, again, if you like what we do here on the show, you can subscribe to the show's channel down below. Uh, I will see you next week. And until then, guys, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon.